see two of them, they're all three of them there. They're looking at Vian. They came walking up to us. They're now less than three feet from the vehicle. I can't even see, I can only see them through the camera lens. They are so close to us, I cannot see them through the, over the passenger door. She seems to be very relaxed about the situation, but I don't want to incur her wrath at this stage, obviously. They've taken upon, taken upon, taken it upon themselves to come this close to us, and we can see. Oh, this is just amazing! It's unbelievable. They're bigger than house cats now. You can see that very clearly now. And what I would like you to take note of is that I said the other day, somebody asked why don't they approach vehicles like hyena cubs. I said, well. I don't really know. Leopard cubs don't because leopard adults don't and leopards aren't as confident. But these chaps have done precisely what I said I didn't know if they would. And they're right close to us now. They've approached us, stalked us. The little, other little one is now out in front. They've lost interest slightly. The mother is watching us very carefully, so I'm speaking quietly. And Viam is making very slow moves on the back with the camera. Nothing sudden about anything we're doing here. You must never forget that things can go, or situations can change extremely fast out here as soon as you start to get complacent about any of this stuff. Greg, what a lovely question from you while we talk very quietly in this situation. You say, are the vehicles likely to be perceived as another grazing animal by these cats um, or, or as opposed to a sort of bipedal threat? I think one half of that is correct. They don't see us as a bipedal threat, that is clear, because they wouldn't let us get anywhere near as close as this if they were on foot and they wouldn't approach us if we were on foot. That said, this car doesn't smell like a grazer, it doesn't eat, it comes and, and sits next to them. A grazer, they would be, you know, a big grazer like a rhino or an elephant they would move away from. A small grazer they would eat if it came this close to them. So it's somewhere in between. They don't see us as a threat, they don't see us as something to eat and it's quite an interesting situation that I'm not sure anyone has very clearly understood. And what's very interesting is at least, so let's just try and sex them while they're sitting out there like that. One male, one female there, those two. No, it's just the other one we don't know. Greg, what happens, or as a friend of mine said to me once, he said, a lion can spot a monkey's ear behind a tree at a hundred meters. How on earth can we think that they don't recognize what we are sitting on the back of these cars? And I think that's a very good point. It's just the fact that they don't perceive us in the same way. They just don't perceive us as a threat. And that is because I think we're not standing up. It's also because our human scent is to some extent masked by the brake fluid and the transmission fluid and the steering fluid and the engine oil and the gas or petroleum that we're burning in the car. Uh, so I think to some extent that's one of the reasons they don't um, perceive us in the same way. 
There's a little lioness there who's got the... Oh no, that's the little lioness there. Hello Cluster Charge, you're a new viewer. And you say, what do we call these cubs when they're older? Um, I'm not really sure how to answer your question. I think maybe you're asking um, what we call them, uh, yearlings, juveniles, maybe, when they're not cubs. Uh, in terms of a name, they probably won't get names because they're part of the pride. Okay, there we can see very clearly two lionesses. Two lionesses, everybody, one male. So we've got one male and two lionesses. That's quite interesting. Very, very sweet. We are sitting with the, the lion still, and the lioness has made a return. She actually just did a couple of roars for us, so let's see if she does it again. I don't know who she's trying to call. Maybe the third lioness that's missing from the Styx Pride. I'm not so sure. Because as far as I've heard, she's been hanging around quite far away from here, sort of um, towards the nets, which is, well, I suppose it's actually not too, not too far from here. So she could probably hear her calls, but I think her cubs are still a bit too young. From, I think we, they, we had a rangers meeting and they said that they were born on the 28th of February, so quite late. Uh, so they, they're basically just a month old now, so we might start to see them soon. They might be brought back to the pride. This is, this is fantastic. It's such a wonderful morning out here. It's actually getting very hot. I'm going to have to take my jacket off now. I'm feeling a little bit, a little bit too warm. But our little cubs are becoming braver and braver and more comfortable with us. And I don't think we've quite, quite had uh, so much time to spend with the lion for a very long time. Sorry, if you hear a bit of shuffling around, it is me. I'm just removing my big coat. Have a little listen to this one. No, now it's stopped moaning. I do love the sound of a lion, a little lion cub when they are always complaining about everything. Definitely this one takes after mom. You're going back to your lock? No, just sat down behind the car, but we've got another little cub sitting right next to us. Very close. And I just, I can't get enough of looking into their eyes. They really just have the most gorgeous coloration. And in Suku too, and Suku with those yellow, yellow, yellow eyes. When he looks at you, wow, it's really, really quite fantastic. What have you found? A stone. Are you going to pick that up? Yes. It's mine now and I shall take it with me and you will be my best friend for the rest of the day. It always amazes me as to what actually catches the attention of these little cubs. Don't you think? It's always quite funny. They pick up the most bizarre things. I can understand playing with elephant dung because it can roll around. Now I'm going to have got the stone in my mouth and I'm also going to play with a stick. Is that a stone? I don't know. Maybe it's a piece of slate. That's what it could be. <laughs> and now the brave little lion is coming from behind and realize that, hey, what toys do you have that I didn't find? Give them to me. I also want to play with them, please. Now they're going to chase each other. Oh, <laughs> so fat that it fell over. And they were very casual. Great recovery, little lion. Great recovery. You made that look like it was supposed to happen. I actually don't know what that lion is chewing on. I have absolutely no idea. Maybe a guest once lost something. But it will be all right. They won't eat anything they shouldn't eat. It is just life as these lions start to teeth. Is it a, what is that? A piece of rubber? Yes. That actually looks like it's come from a vehicle. It looks like a bit of rubber or something that's maybe torn off. Maybe a mud guard, part of the mud guard. That's exactly what that could be. And that sometimes happens is the way we off-road and things like that. The amount of mud guards I've actually picked up and bit 
bits and pieces of rubber and bolts. The amount of bolts I've picked up off of the ground, which scares me a little bit because at the rate at which we find them, it means that the vehicles can't be doing too well. But don't worry, don't, don't panic. It's really just chewing on it because it feels nice. It won't, I don't think it will eat it. They're not that silly. But that must feel great. It's often you'll see them chewing on sticks and it feels great on their teeth. Yes, you go tease your sibling with that and go and play with it. No, I'm going to play with it on the elephant dung now. That's wonderful. If these lions do move and this little cub does drop it, I shall pick it up and I shall put it in the car. But for the moment, I can't really do too much about it, except we can just watch it as it chews in this beautiful golden morning light. Isn't that lovely? Look how the light is catching its eyes. I'm actually really impressed at the condition that these little cubs are in. They're looking great. They're not looking too mangy, just a couple of patches behind the elbows. So hopefully they keep cleaning themselves and with the abundance of food that's around at the moment, I think that they should be all right. They've definitely got a much better chance now. During the drought, there really wasn't much hope for them. Yes, don't eat that. Don't be naughty. This is so stunning. Really, really beautiful. Yes, you pull on that. Now, Fork and Noodles, you've asked a, quite an interesting question, so we'll go into a bit of a discussion about this, but you said, how do they prevent ancestral mating uh, with, the, with the cubs that come through? So, uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite amazing how nature's actually figured this out. So that is why the females stick together and the boys come and go. The males never really stay with the pride for too long. It's normally a couple of years, and a couple of generations of inbreeding is normal and natural out here, but can you believe it? Obviously with us as humans it's completely different, but with the cats and with the various animals it's fine, it's not frowned upon. However, you won't find a coalition of male lions lasting for more than two or three years, sometimes a bit longer if it's a really big coalition and all the members have managed to uh, survive. They might stay for a bit longer than that. Having a good groom. So what happens is that new younger males, fresh, fresh genes come through, chase out the old boys. And then that way when they start mating with the females is a completely new bloodline. And then of course those younger cubs that are now two or three years old, the females will start mating with, with the new boys. And if there are any new cubs around, unfortunately, uh, if, if there's a pride takeover, uh, then they will be killed by the new males if they're only if they're less than about if normally if they get to about a year and a half two years they'll be all right but anything less than that uh, the boys will take out the new males so they'll unfortunately kill them and that is nature those males don't want to spend all their energy on raising someone else's uh, genetics and make ensuring their survival they obviously want their own genetics to be the ones uh, that fill up the lion population they're starting to settle down now as it gets warmer, but that's of course no surprise. But we might stay here for a little bit longer. I'm not too sure just yet. We'll see how they behave. But let's go across to Byron, who's gone from birding to one of the largest mammals in the world.